Regular viewers of this channel probably know that I sometimes go by the initialism tug, so you can imagine my surprise when I started watching this movie and five minutes in, a character named Tug meets his ultimate demise. The Buddy movie is almost as old as film itself, with most academic commentators noting that it is a largely American storytelling trope that can trace its roots as far back as Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. It all has something to do with male bonding, though there are a few buddy movies like Thelma and Louise that are about women. The basic idea is you take two characters of the same gender, sometimes more, who have different personalities or backgrounds and you pair them up to have adventures together, highlighting relationship dynamics that have little or nothing to do with romance. It can be seen in anything from westerns like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and the Defiant Ones, to comedies like Some Like It Hot and The Odd Couple. You're crazy. I'm a neurotic nut, but you're crazy. I'm crazy, huh? Boy, that's really funny coming from a fruitcake like you. However, a prominent subset of the buddy movie is the buddy cop movie, which can actually trace its roots across the Pacific Ocean to Japan, starting with Akira Kurosawa's Stray Dog. In the 1980s, with staple westerns all but erased from the cinema scene, the buddy cop movie exploded in popularity both in America and abroad. Films like Lethal Weapon, Beverly Hills Cop, and Running Scared were cleaning up at the domestic box office by exploring real social issues like racism, classism, and poverty, a trend popularized by the neo-noir in the heat of the night. And though science fiction had explored some buddy movie tropes in films like Enemy Mine, it took until 1988 for an explicit sci-fi flick to fashion itself as a true buddy cop movie. Refugees from outer space have come to Earth and are slowly integrating into human society. After the brutal death of his partner at the hands of these newcomers, Detective Matthew Sykes wants to take matters into his own hands to investigate a growing crime syndicate within the alien subculture. As such, he takes on the first newcomer policeman, Sam George Francisco, to help him understand the aliens and uncover the conspiracy that cost his former partner his life. Gail Ann Hurd, who started her Hollywood career as Roger Corman's executive assistant, rose through the ranks, formed her own production company, helped solidify the career of fellow Corman alumnus James Cameron by producing both The Terminator and Aliens, and was, by 1987, regularly being sent spec scripts by 20th Century Fox. One such script, penned by TV writer Rockney S. O. Bannon, was marked as urgent, given that other studios were already in play. Heard thought the story was both exciting and provocative, and agreed to produce it for the studio. She then gave O'Bannon's script to James Cameron, her husband at the time, for a little uncredited punch-up before hiring Graham Baker, the British director behind Omen 3 The Final Conflict and Impulse, to direct. The film went through a few different working titles, including Future Tense, Outer Heat, and Space Cop LA 1991, my personal favorite, before settling on Alien Nation. And it was greenlit for a late 1987 start on a budget of roughly $16 million. Hey, do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? Drop it down in the comments below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you still haven't gotten enough of me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emagill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more science fiction classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. To play Detective Matthew Sykes, the human half of our buddy cop pair, they hired the veteran actor James Kahn, 
famous for The Godfather, and known on this channel for Rollerball. Alien Nation marked a long-anticipated return for the actor, as he'd taken a five-year hiatus for personal reasons we don't need to get into. Khan's performance as an alien racist divorcee is one of the film's major highlights, though Khan himself is pretty dismissive of it, citing a dislike for the director and a low opinion of the story as, quote, silly stuff, unquote. His alien partner, however, is played by Broadway legend Mandy Patinkin, fresh off his screen performance as Inigo Montoya in The Princess Bride. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father. Prepare to die. His character in Alien Nation was originally supposed to be named George Jetson, to the point that, even during filming, all of his props and costumes were labeled Jetson. However, due to rights issues, they couldn't use the name and replaced it with Samuel Francisco, subsequently adding in a brief bit of dialogue where Sykes decides to call him George anyway. I'm not going to introduce you to people as San Francisco. I think I'll call you George. George? Okay. Okay. Patinkin has since been very vocal about his dissatisfaction with this change, and insists that no matter what the film says, his character will always be George Jetson. The primary antagonist of the film, the alien drug kingpin William Harcourt, is played by Terence Stamp, probably best known at the time for playing General Zod in Superman. No. Kneel before Zod. Meanwhile, Sykes' ill-fated partner at the start of the movie, Tug, is played by Roger Aaron Brown. Other notable actors include Commander at Zircon herself, Leslie Bevis, as the alien stripper Cassandra, George Genesky, aka Conrad Dunn, as one of Harcourt's goons. Any progress? My arm's getting tired. So far, zip. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> and the always imposing Brian Thompson as Porter, who would go on to be the only cast member to return for future installments of the franchise, albeit as a different character. One small role, Henry, the first alien newcomer shown in the film, is played by Don Pugsley, whose lack of credit garnered a formal apology in Daily Variety magazine. Filming lasted for 61 days between October 1987 and January 1988, in and around Los Angeles. Some of the key locations used are the LA Police Academy, Zuma Beach, the Biltmore Hotel, and an Anheuser-Busch brewery. Oh, hold on a second. You see that prop with the weird lights? It's about time I talk about that thing, as it has cameoed on this channel before. It is called, and I swear I'm not making this up, the most important device in the universe. Designed and manufactured by the company Modern Props, specifically its founder, John Zabrucki, its original name was simply Modern Props number 195-290-1, and for whatever reason, it became a fixture of science fiction throughout the late 70s, the 80s, and well into the 90s. Every so often, it even crops up today. If you've watched a lot of sci-fi, as I'm sure most of you have, You've undoubtedly seen it before. Nobody knows its true purpose, but everyone knows how important it is. What have you found? All I've found is that these red lights keep moving back and forth. Aside from that, this thing seems to have no other function whatsoever, sir. Well, that's impossible. It must have some sort of function. No doubt the biggest challenge faced by the makers of Alien Nation was the alien makeup effects. In early drafts of the script, the newcomers had fins attached to their heads that would expand when they got excited. Oh no, my deal is doing the thing! But this was dropped by Baker, opting to go for a more human and streamlined look. Stan Winston Studios was then hired to do the job, along with makeup artist Zoytan Elek, known for crafting the look of Max Hedrum. Elek insisted on making the newcomers look even more human by giving them natural skin color, as opposed to the weird shade of yellow that was planned, while the effects masters at Stan Winston Studios, including the likes of Tom Woodruff, Shane Mahan, and Alec Gillis, got to work designing rubber headpieces for each of the principal newcomer characters, with backups needing to have precisely the same spot markings painted on. Even with these headpieces, though, each of the actors still had to sit for four hours to have makeup applied each day. 
For less visible newcomers, they had less expensive and detailed prosthetics and makeup designs on a graded scale determined by how close the actor would be to the camera. For example, if a newcomer was in the middle distance, he or she would have less detail than a close-up newcomer and more detail than a background extra. The music was originally composed by Jerry Goldsmith, but his score, which was itself based on a rejected score for Wall Street, was rejected, possibly due to the heavy re-edits that the studio demanded during post-production. Instead, the score in the final film is composed by Kurt Sobel, whose only previous credit is 1984's The Flamingo Kid. Alien Nation was originally scheduled to release in the late summer of 1988, but it was pushed back to October for the aforementioned re-edits, which drastically changed a few action scenes, excised an entire character or two, and forced some clever ADR work to change a few names. I understand. You've been resisting my offer, Mr. Strader. When the movie finally did release on October 7th, it got a middling response from critics, but earned a relatively decent $25.2 million at the domestic box office. This was enough to convince the studio to greenlight a short-lived television series based on the film, and the franchise would continue in several made-for-TV movies after that, in addition to various comic books and tie-in novels. A remake has been in the works for years, with it now looking like it will be a streaming series instead of a theatrical film, but news about the project is spotty at best. When I first saw the original Alien Nation as a kid, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was boring. It was years later that I gave it a second chance, and I'm glad I did, because underneath the obvious subtext and standard 80s buddy cop formula, replete with the drugs angle, Alien Nation is a neat little sci-fi flick that doesn't really have pretensions to be more than it is. It certainly lays a lot of groundwork to be expanded upon with the hints at a deep lore for sci-fi fans to geek out over, but the core of the movie remains very human, doing what sci-fi does best by reflecting our own humanity, by pushing a little past the boundaries of reality. Its take on race relations in LA is very 1980s, but I respect it for its nuance and its refusal to be a black and white morality tale. The story sets itself up to be about a bad cop learning to be a good cop by confronting his own character flaws, and while it is true that Detective Sykes is far less ignorant and racist in the end, what actually winds up happening is that George, the apparently by-the-book alien good guy, learns to be a little more corrupt in the end, that life is far too complicated for simplistic views of morality. During the climax, it is Sykes who has to pull George back from the brink, not the other way around, and that gives the story a kind of gritty honesty that made the decade's various cop dramas so provocative. Don't get me wrong, I love the science fiction elements of the story, and I could totally go down the rabbit hole of what makes the newcomers such an interesting alien species, or how Alien Nation is just one of many examples out there of aliens being used as an effective allegory for immigration, but Alien Nation, which is absolutely a sci-fi classic, is only wearing the veil of science fiction. It's first and foremost a buddy cop movie, as perfectly expressed in the scene at the middle of the film where George and Sykes get drunk and bond over their families and their shared humanity. That, and this is a movie where Terrence Stamp takes so many drugs that he becomes a literal monster. How can you not want to see that? And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What are some of your favorite buddy cop movies? Let me know in the comments, and while you're there, like and subscribe because you know you want to. Thank you for watching, and until next time, when we'll see what happens when two of my previous topics clash with one another over a giant egg, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
get some sleep. You better drive. You're too screwed up to walk. <laughs> 